Greetings once again in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. How blessed we are. How wonderful it is to be able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth on this first Sunday of April. Amen. I'm glad the day is April the 2nd and not April the 1st because y'all would be trying to April fool me. Amen. And so I know, I know that it's just a matter of time before the sanctuary fill up because this is not April fool. Amen, amen, and amen. How delighted we are. We're delighted to have all of those persons who are sharing with us in person and uh, online and social media. And so we welcome uh, SMZ, welcome Philadelphia and vicinity, and welcome all those who are watching from around the world. Amen. We are delighted. Who we are delighted to have uh, uh, Brother Lamont Dante Jackson is on this morning. Sister Kita, Kita Blackwell, all the way from Felton. Amen. Delaware, Sister Paulette Wilson is on board all the way from Southwest Philadelphia. Amen. Sister Gwendolyn McDowell is on board all the way from Roche, Boston, Buffalo, New York. Amen. We're delighted to have Sister Bernetta Robinson Dorn is on board. Brother June Coe is on board. Deacon Leroy Hagler is on board. Sister Hattie Foster is on board. Sister Tiffany Barrett is on board. Sister Dion Hyatt is on board. Delighted to have Deacon Dan Johnson is on board. Delighted to have our Georgia connection, Sister Betty Trimble, all the way from Statesboro, Georgia. Amen. Sister Jane Johnson, all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Sister Cheryl Haley is on board. Amen. You don't know where she is. She could be across the country and around the world somewhere. Amen. Sister Olivia Macmillan is on board all the way from Maryland. Amen. And so we are delighted to have all of those persons on board. Amen. And all of you who are in person and all of those who are visiting with us this morning. And so we want to say welcome. Amen. Let us stand. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Oh, 
Good morning, beautiful congregation, Second Mile Zion. Aren't you lovely this morning? Yes, you are. Our scripture lesson this morning can be found in the book of beginnings, Genesis. And I just love when pastor goes back to the beginnings. Chapter 35, verses 20 through 29. And I grabbed the NIV version, I'm sorry, the um, New Living Translation this morning, so it reads such. Jacob set up a stone monument over Rachel's grave, and it can be seen there to this day. Then Jacob traveled on and camped beyond Adar. While he was living there, Reuben had intercourse with Belhah, yeah, his father's concubine. And Jacob soon heard about it. These are the names of the 12 sons of Jacob. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's oldest son, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, were Gad and Asher. These are the names of the sons who were born to Jacob at Padanaram. So Jacob returned to his father Isaac in Merami, which is near Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had both lived as foreigners. Isaac lived for 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died a ripe old age, joining his ancestors in death, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Whew, that's gonna preach the word of God. Lord, right now we just thank you for another day. We thank you for this gathering of your people today in this, your house. We pray that you continue to watch over us as we go to and fro. We pray that you continue to keep us in the bosom of your heart. Father, right now, we thank you for this season that we celebrate you setting your face like a stone towards Jerusalem. For if it had not been for the work you did on Calvary's rugged cross, we know we would not be here today. So Father, right now, we pray that you open up our hearts to your word. We pray that you open up our minds to receive what you have given us so that we may be called your people and the world may see the salt that you have sprinkled within us and let us light, be the light of the world. It is in Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Everybody clap your hands right here.
Amen. How many came to give him the praise today? On this wonderful Lord's Day, this Palm Sunday, we celebrate. Amen. We welcome you to today's installation of the Sunday School lesson. Our Sunday School lesson will be taken this morning from Luke, Luke chapter 24, and we will look at verses 1 through 12, and our key verse is 5b and 5a, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, and our topic is amazing encounters, amen, and as we get to this and the Teenagers are headed off to their class and the young folk are headed off to their class. Amen. It's just good to be in the house of the Lord to be taught. Amen. All right. Before we get into the lesson, just some brief announcements. As always, we ask that you would send your mail correspondence, specifically your tithes, to our post office box, which is P.O. Box 41839, Philadelphia, PA 19101. And for those of you who are in person, please use the tithing box in the back of the sanctuary. As always, eating and drinking is prohibited in the sanctuary. And we ask that if any member of your family becomes sick or ill, please call, call the church and leave a message so we can have proper knowledge of, uh, of that event. Amen. Also coming up, coming up this Friday, Friday for Good Friday, we will have the seven last words and that will take place at Greater Faith Baptist Church at noon. So 40th and bearing, we will have the seven last words. Amen. And then on Saturday, we will have our annual uh, Easter trunk hunt. Uh, so we ask that you would come out and participate. Bring your children. We'll be in the parking lot. Uh, we will have a great time in the name of the Lord, celebrating our Lord for the children. And then uh, the layman's, we want to remind you of the layman's luncheon, which takes place June 17th. Please see uh, Deacon Vaughn Davis for ticket information. And our church anniversary, which is coming up the end of the month, April 23rd. Y'all know what we, we ask. We ask that you would uh, give $125 or more. If you, uh, That is what we are asking for our church anniversary as we celebrate our church's anniversary, which is 94 years. Amen. We are celebrating. And then finally, Saturday, August 5th, the second Mount Zion picnic. You can sign up in the lobby. There's flyers for you to sign up. We ask that you would sign up so we can get a count or that we should know that if we should have this event or not. Amen. We need to know if you're going. And I know it seems far off, but it'll come up soon. Amen. Yeah, you can scan the QR code and it'll give you all the information. Use your phone. And if you have trouble, just see myself, Deacon Green. There's a QR code. Just scan that with your phone, with your uh how you take pictures, take a picture of that, and it'll bring up all the information. If you have any trouble, just see myself, Deacon Green, or see somebody that's under 30. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. That'll work. Anybody under 30, they, they know what this means. Y'all might not know what those little squiggly lines mean, but they know. Amen. All right. All right. Let's get into the lesson. The lesson is familiar. We are looking at the gospel as accorded by Luke. And as we know, uh, Luke is the author who also pens Acts. And let's stick a pen in that because this lesson will play into what happens of the events of Acts. Luke, who is referred to at, by Paul as that beloved physician. Now, Luke as well as the other synoptic gospels, he differs a little bit because he writes from a different perspective. And when we look at this lesson, we'll see this lesson from the lens of Dr. Luke. And so you'll see that he writes uh, from a perspective where Gentiles is his target audience, which affects how he writes. Um, you will see that uh, his uh, physician background becomes evident because of the high profile that he gives Jesus' healing ministry. And Luke, of all the gospel writers, writes in a more chronicle, 
chronological orders, and he presents Jesus as the son of man, a man of compassion and sympathy towards the marginalized in society. So when you look at Luke, some of the um, major uh, themes is Jesus's compassion for Gentiles, Samaritans, women, children, poor, and others often regarding as the outcasts in society. And we've seen that when we talked about the woman at the well, when we looked at Luke, um, who he gives priority that many of the other gospel writers may not. Um, so we see that, and it sticks with his theme, is that the universal scope of the gospel information and his theme can be found in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So we'll see how, how Luke's perspective. Now, this is, this is familiar, uh, familiar text, our lesson. It's familiar and it's fitting for the day. Amen. Because it is, takes place the events after the crucif crucifixion of Jesus and Jesus has been buried and, and the Sabbath has come. So the women could not, or Jesus' body could not be properly prepared as they would want to. So the women wait uh, after the Sabbath and first thing in the morning, because it, it will say upon the first week, and Luke will tell you very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher bringing spices, which they had prepared. Which begs the question, what have you prepared? What did you prepare to bring today? Bible tells you to lay up, lay aside, make some preparations. I'm talking about tired, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about because y'all quiet. Yeah. Worship, you have to prepare for worship. And I'm just not talking about laying out your Sunday best. Amen. Thank God next week is communion Sunday, so I ain't got to worry about what suit I'm going to wear. I already know. I already know. I already know what suit I'm wearing, Leroy. So I ain't got to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, y'all getting y'all Easter stuff together, right? Getting the hat together, y'all getting the suit, and that's that's a that's a preparation. But that ain't the only preparation y'all need to do. Amen. You need to prepare your mind. You need to prepare spiritually. The woman, the women prepared and they brought. So if you didn't make any preparations this week, next week, let's make preparations. And we've been asking you to make preparations for the fourth Sunday in April. Amen. Y'all know I better stop. Y'all getting quiet. But they made preparations. They brought the spices which they had prepared and, 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 and the women and they come and and. As I say, uh, uh, Luke's will differ slightly from the other. All four gospel writers uh, look at this version of the tomb. And let me say, when we look at this lesson, um, there's some lessons that can be learned from the empty tomb. Lessons from the empty tomb. Now, they came and they, it says that they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. Now, the implication of that is that Jesus was buried, and then when he was buried, they placed a big stone over the covering, and also they placed guards out front so that nobody could, so because of grave robbers, they want to ensure. And so the women, in spite of the challenge of wondering when they get to church, or oh, I'm sorry, when they get to the tomb, what they're going to face. But that didn't stop them from coming to church. I mean, coming to the tomb. Despite of some obstacles along the way or when they got there, they still came. And when they came, they found the, the stone rolled away. And I think it's Matthew who will tell you that there was an earthquake that happened and the stone, rolled, stone rolls away. But anyway, they find it and they go in and they don't find what they're looking for. They're looking for a body. They're looking for Jesus. They're looking in the tomb, the sepulcher, the cemetery, amongst the dead. And how many times do we 
look for the answers of our problems amongst the dead. The dead. And it perplexed them. And then they noticed two men, which are angels that are standing about. And they ask an, intri and, and they ask an intriguing question. The question is, why ye seek the living amongst the dead? The ladies came with no hope. Lessons from the tomb, the hope. Thank you. They came to the cemetery without hope. The terror of Good Friday still looms. The grief of Saturday was still upon them. But they came to church. But they didn't have hope. Because they didn't have hope, they only came grieving and came to do what was, what was necessary or what they thought they had to do, right? They come without hope. And the first lesson we learn from this teachable moment of the tomb is the hope of resurrection. The hope of resurrection. Uh, can you get me, I forgot to give y'all this in the booth, Psalms 30 verse five. And how many times do we, we don't have hope and we go looking in all the wrong places for hope. We go dredge up dead situations for hope. But I like, and we've seen this verse, it says, for his anger was for a moment, the favor of his life, but weeping may endure for a night, but joy. Sometimes we never get to the joy of the moment because we let our weeping, we let our nights run on and on and on and on. And so here these women are, they are, they are weeping, weeping for the night, but they come in the hope of the tomb. The hope of that is that they find it empty. What's that mean? Jesus isn't there. Let me say this, Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. Jesus isn't in the tomb. And so Jesus has risen. The implication of that, and he had been telling his disciples this for a long time. And it had been hard for them to understand what he was saying, which is understandable. And which is understandable that they are in shock. They had just watched him crucified. They watched him die. So it's hard to believe that when you watch somebody die, you went to the funeral, you seen them buried, you seen the open casket, you seen the first viewing and they had a second viewing and you see their death. So it's hard to believe, but, but, but Jesus had been showing them because remember last week, he just came off the hill of showing that he was, he had power over the sea so much so that they asked, who is this? That the sea has, that nature has to obey him. He raised Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus was dead four days. That was no hope. But sometimes we forget all, this, all these things. Sometimes we have amnesia. We get spiritual amnesia. And so they were perplexed. The man was dead. He says, why, why you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but risen. Remember how he spoke to you when you were yet in Galilee. Remember the things, he, remember those lessons that you learned when you was a kid. Do y'all remember? And this is the problem I fear with our youth is they have no gift of recall. They have no stories. They have no biblical stories. They have nothing to remember. And what do I always say? One of my favorite uh, 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 gospel passage is when you look at John fourteen twenty six. John fourteen twenty six says, but the helper, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will do what? Teach you all things. Teach, you have been taught. But if you like me, sometimes you forget some things. That's why I don't, you know, you don't get a hundred on the test because you forget some things. But not only will he teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said. But if you haven't been taught, you have nothing to remember. You have to be taught. They have to be brought. They have to be taught. We need more church draggers. Like my aunt used to drag me to church. Yeah. And somehow those, those, those little Sunday school lessons, those things you had to memorize when you were a kid, somehow they'll come back to you when you need it. When you desperately need it, when you're in a desperate situation, you'll remember. But if you don't have anything to call to remembrance, I'm afraid that we are in trouble. And so now is the time of remembrance. He says, remember what he said to you? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Are you looking for the living amongst the dead? That dead situation, the dead bottle of alcohol, the dead pill, are you seeking relief? Are you seeking answers amongst that? Y'all ain't got to answer me. It's all right. It's all right. And then they remember the Holy Spirit will help you, but you have to. They heard something. They heard Jesus' teachings. We read some scripture. Jesus, the Holy Spirit will help you to remember. And so they they remember what he said. But what did he say? Well, I'm glad you asked. On three occasions, Jesus predicted his death. Luke 9, 22, the first prediction. And all the gospel writers address this, but I'm gonna address it in Luke. Luke 9, 22, saying the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests, scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. Second time, Luke chapter nine, looking at verses 44 through 45. Let these words sink down into your ears. The son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. <laughs> But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them, so they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. He said, let them sink into your ears. Y'all need to let some words sink in. Maybe that's why y'all quiet. The third time he predicts, Luke chapter 18, 31, 33. Then he took the 12 aside and said to them, he took them aside and said to them, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man will be accomplished for he will be delivered to the Gentiles, will be mocked, insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Another teachable moment from the empty tomb is that Jesus dealt with death before death happened. He prepared them for his death. And many times we don't talk about that uncomfortable subject of death, that taboo subject of death, but we all will have to pass that way. So why not prepare and make preparations Get your affairs in order so that there won't be any controversy at the funeral as to what's going to happen. None of y'all ain't never experienced that, I know. Y'all ain't never experienced nobody fighting over where we going to have the funeral, what we going to have, when it's going to be, who going to get the money. Yeah, y'all ain't, ain't experienced that part, right? Y'all got y'all got y'all stuff in order. Y'all got it all written out. So when you go, everybody knows. But Pastor Moore will tell the story of about his father and how they talked about death. And I was at the funeral and I seen them celebrate. That was a celebration. 
I'm not sure I could handle it like the way they handled it. But they handle it because it did not catch them so much off guard that they were not prepared for the moment that death was coming, that death was a reality. But not only their father made preparations that after he died, what should happen? The lesson from the tomb, and this is the big lesson. Now catch this now. Jesus is preparing, is preparing the church that's going to form an acts. When Peter preaches, 3,000 people get saved, and we have the church. He's preparing them to operate without his presence, without the body. Up until now, they have Jesus. They can go right to him. They got a problem? Call Jesus. Can't get the demon out? Call Jesus. Got a woman with issue, but call Jesus. Ain't got enough wine for the party? Call Jesus. But now Jesus will not be with them physically. He has been teaching them and they haven't been understanding. And now he's preparing not only them, but he's preparing the church. He's preparing us how to operate without his physical presence. The faith. That's where our faith is coming in. So Jesus has been preparing them and talking about death all the while. Three, at least three times he addresses this subject this uncomfortable subject of death. And he addresses it in no uncertain terms, what will happen? It's gonna be ugly. I'm gonna be betrayed, I'm gonna be beaten, I'm gonna be spit upon, I'm gonna die. But he doesn't leave you there, he, gets, he says, I'm going to get up. The miracle of the empty tomb. So we learn from the empty tomb, hope, and that's why Paul can say in 1 Thessalonians, I didn't get y'all this either, my bad. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Yeah, I'm slipping, my bad. I'm slipping. But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, a euphemism for death. Least you sorrow like others who have no hope. Preparation. We should not sorrow like those who have no hope. Why? because of the resurrect, because of the empty tomb, the implications is that in him getting up, Romans 6, 4, we can get up, walk in the newness of life, and we can have everlasting life. Some of y'all gonna get that when y'all get home. Y'all gonna get the beauty of that. So death should not scare you, because first of all, we all gotta go through that, right? Now the process of death might scare me, but death should not take you unaware. And this is what Jesus had been teaching them, but they didn't understand it. So the empty tomb is a time for understanding and revelation as well. So the women come, they find the tomb empty, they forget everything they're gonna do and they run back to tell the apostles. Now, it's interesting how Jesus will appear first to the woman, Mary Magdalene. The first people to be aware of the risen, resurrected Savior are women. The first people to testify of the resurrection are women. The first people to be hated or to not believe are the women. These women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the mother of James, and the other women with them, they told these things to the apostles. And it says that their words seemed as idle tales and they believed them not. The struggle of believing. When they say it don't take all that. Folk gonna question your faith. You believe he got up? You believe in this Jesus that you can't see? This Holy Spirit? You believe in the Trinity of God? The struggle of believing. But here's how you overcome the struggle. 
Peter arose, ran to the sepulcher. He ran, says John ran too, outran him, but he didn't go in. Peter being as bold goes in. Stooping down, behold, the linen cloth lay, and he departing wondered himself, what was come to pass? The skepticism. And before I get to how you overcome the struggle, let me just say that a lot of us are guilty of listening but not hearing. We are guilty of hearing the word but not internalizing the word. Jesus had told him on no less than three occasions that this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be spit upon. I am going to die, but I will get up. I will. He tells them that. He tells them that. And they don't understand. They forget whatever the case is. And when it happens, they're torn to pieces. They're back sitting and wondering, what just happened here? And how many times when death hits us do we sit around wondering what happened? Instead of the preparations that have been made. And so... How do you, how you overcome the struggle is that you got to experience the empty tomb for yourself. And how do you experience the empty tomb? You read about it. He had to experience it. And once he experienced it and struggled with this reality, and some of y'all need to struggle with the word. David struggled, but it made him a better person. His name was changed. Some of us, we have to struggle, and after a struggle with the word, we get a clarity of it. But I'm afraid, I'm afraid, and I'm going to digress for a second, because what it also shows you is the process of salvation. Salvation is a process. It takes a while to learn. It took... And, 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 and these 12, they kind of had an AP course, so to speak, on salvation, right? Because they were with him three years, and they were learning, but they were struggling to learn. But it wasn't until after he died that the Holy Spirit comes now that they understand fully. But for some of us, it takes a, it, it's a process of salvation. But I'm afraid that sometimes we live on the extremes of salvation. What do I mean? Before, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, there were two male factors with him, the thief, right? And one blasphemes him and one asks for forgiveness and he gets salvation right there on the cross before he dies which means he lived his life and he did all these things. But before he died, he got salvation, he got saved and went to heaven. Then there's Paul who gets instant salvation. He gets knocked off his beast on the road to Damascus and gets saved right there, starts doing the work for the Lord. And sometimes we live on those extremes. Either we get saved or, or, or we have our own plan and we say, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to party it up and I'm going to get it out my system. Then I'm going to get saved. But there's a process to salvation. There's a process to this. And so the, the disciples had the, the APs, their course was speeded up because they needed it, right? But for us, it's a process. Because we're still processing, we're still understanding what does this mean? What does it mean to do well to those who despitefully use you? You know, those, those, those scriptures that you wish wasn't in the Bible that you just skip on over. But you, but you better use them. Thank you, Pandora. Right? These, faith, the, these, these, he got up. This is why Pastor Moore will tell you every Sunday, somewhere, somehow, before he, before he sits down, he's going to tell you that he died and he got up. Because it's, if he doesn't get up, there's no confirmation. If he doesn't get up, what does that mean for me? 
Paul would say it's all in vain. If he doesn't get up, but thank God that he gets up, that we can get up every day and do what we got to do. And so you, you, you find these lessons in this. You find the hope of the, of the empty tomb. You find the, the hope in the process of salvation from the empty tomb. You find revelation and understanding from the empty tomb. There's a lot of lessons to be taught that we need to understand what does the empty tomb mean? What does it mean that he got up? Y'all should be shouting like this is the Super Bowl. And, and y'all winning. Y'all actually won. <laughs> the hope of the empty tomb. These women came there with no hope. No hope that he, that, 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 that dead situation would change. But when they got there, the dead was risen. And they left with hope. They left, they left, they forgot what they was doing and went to tell somebody. Y'all need to tell somebody that there's hope yet still alive. Hope has risen. Hope is there. The lesson from the empty tomb. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Simpson, for our church school lesson. And uh, did you get to that part that you was going to get to about the implications to the Acts, the book, the book, the book of Acts? Luke, Luke is, uh, uh, you know, Luke has two books. He has the book of Luke and also the book of Acts. And uh, Luke is, 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 is really his, his first uh, volume. And volume two is the book of Acts. And Luke de does a unique thing. He emphasizes, but Charlie, glad you asked. He emphasizes the empty tomb without the body. And now that has implications for the, God, for, for the uh, book of Acts because Luke is setting us up for the ministry and mission of the church. The ministry and mission of the church. See, the church has to operate without Reverend Stafford, the body of Jesus. And so Luke sets us up and he emphasizes that the tomb is empty and there is no body because he's getting us ready for the church to operate and ministry in a time of the Holy Spirit without the physical body of Jesus. That's all I got to say. Amen. All right, uh, we're going to have uh, a representative from Amen, Sister Chanel's class today. Amen. Her star, one of her star people. Um, what I took from today's lesson is like, when God was alive, he went through his life and performed like so many miracles. Like he went to people's house, you're blind, now you can see, right? And he went through his life, committed all these miracles. And now he, this, the story didn't end yet. He, already, he, he, he didn't really die, but he died for us. He died for us and that was his greatest miracle. His greatest miracle was after his death. 
all, all other great people, they die, and that's the end of their story. Yeah. But he died, and he continued committing miracles after he already died. Um, and, and after that, after that, now he's no longer in flesh. He's, he's a spiritual being. And, and he continues doing great things every single day. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, I think at this time, uh, Sister Josephine, if you can get, get me the uh, palms, we'll go ahead on and bless the palms now, and uh, we will dedicate them for uh, the purpose of victory. Amen. Amen. That's what they symbolize. They symbolize the victory, the victory that Jesus won over death. Amen. Uh, and uh, the victory that he won for us and uh, that he took, he took the sting out of death for us so that we would not have to uh, experience death. Amen. Somebody should have said amen. amen. And, so, and so we are no longer, we don't have to be afraid of death. The process might concern us. That will lead to death, but, but we don't have to be afraid of death. All right. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Reverend Stafford if he would come now and... Uh, and uh, dedicate these these palms to the to the glory of God, and they would symbolize the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Now you, you can you can let him do it from there. Give it give him my mic. Father God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for victories won. Those that are seen and those that are not seen. We thank you for taking the sting out of death so that we don't have to experience the trauma, the trouble, those fears therein. Lord God, we're able to celebrate the newness that comes in the victory. Lord God, we're able to celebrate all that you've done because you did it for us in order that we might have this new relationship with you. So Lord God, because you've claimed the victory and you caused the victory to be so, we too can claim the victory and seek to live thereby. So we dedicate these palms unto thee, O Lord, that upon receiving them, we might weigh them and celebrate the victory all the more. Let this be to your glory and to the strength of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, let me see. Somebody said that that scripture that they read uh, was going to preach, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to do a a short exposition on the scripture since they read the scripture, because uh, really we have a we have another preacher today. We have a we have a senior senior pastor of this city, uh, Pastor Emeritus, 
of the Mount Carmel Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Albert Franklin Campbell will be our preacher for today. And, and we want to give him a few moments to get here because I called him at the last minute this morning. And when I got up and uh, I discovered that I was not, my voice was not necessarily its normal self. And so I thought about who, would, who could uh, preach for us, and I wanted a senior pastor, and, and I called the Reverend Dr. Albert Franklin Campbell, and he, and he consented to come and preach for us. And so he's going to be our preacher, but I will do a short exposition of the text from Genesis chapter 35. Uh, Oh, yes, yes, yes. Why don't I do that first? Thank you. Why don't we do the, why don't we do the April birthdays first, and then I will come back with uh, an exposition of our scripture. Amen? Amen. And they're going, they're going to give me that, uh, they're going to give me that, uh, uh, that key that I sing in. Amen. Now, now what's, that's my key. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right, all right. Now, uh, now, uh, some of y'all are uh, some of y'all are party animals, and y'all and y'all just love that Stevie Wonder style. Uh, I see, I see y'all bumping already. So, so, uh, brother Aaron, we're gonna have to start doing two versions of it. All right, y'all, give me that other version. That's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so uh, very much. Uh, last week, last week, let me, let's just do a recap of last week. Last, last week we talked about the features of a revival and we said that uh, revivals are not called or uh, does not happen because you've got it on the calendar. God has to call for a revival and he called Jacob to go back to Bethel. And Bethel in the Bible, everywhere you see Bethel, that simply means house of God. But then Jacob, Jacob in revival, when, God, when he went back to Bethel and he renewed his commitment with the Lord and the Lord renewed his promises with him, uh, there was the message of revival, and the message of revival you had you 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 gotta you gotta straighten up yourself. You gotta get you gotta get straight. And uh, the message of the revival is you gotta clean up some stuff. 
and you got to put away the false gods that is among you. And uh, we have some false gods that is among us. The false god of fame, the false god of money, the false god of wealth, the false god of clothes, the false god of possessions. Amen. And so all of those are false gods. And, and uh, the next feature of revival is uh, obedience. Obedience, obedience, yes, yes. Bring Dr. Campbell and Sister Campbell all the way down front, right here to my left. Amen, right behind Brother Jim. Amen, I mean Deacon Jim. But we, 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 call, we call each other by first names. Amen. Amen, Amen. And, and so, and so, and so there, there is always, there is also the value of revival the value of revival. Once, once they've been revived, there has to be some value. And what is the value of revival? The value of revival, watch me now, watch me now. I said the value, you know what the value of revival is? It prepares you to run into all, every obstacle that can come your way. The reason, the reason that some of us can't go, can't take nothing and can't go through anything because we have not been revived. Because in revival, not only does God renew his promises to us, but God, but, 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 but he, uh, we have to surrender to him. And what's the value now? I'm going to give you some values of revival. The values of revival is he's able to deal with the death of a spouse. Pandora, his wife, died. And uh, the record says that, that Jacob buried Rachel, but Israel moved on. Because Israel is his new name, and he's operating now in the power of God. And so revival helps us, it helps us to overcome the death of a spouse. Not only, not only, not only does it helps us to overcome the death of a spouse, his wife died, but when you read chapter 35 and toward the end, you will see the, it helps him to deal with the sin of a son. Ha. <sighs> because our children don't always do what we want them to do. And sometimes they do shameful stuff and sometimes they embarrass us, but revival helps us to deal with the sin of a son. And then finally, the value of revival, it helps us to deal with the death of a father. Because Isaac was 180 years old, and he died. Watch this now. Revival also helps us to work together with people that we can't stand. Esau and Jacob came together for a common cause and buried their father. And so revival helped Jacob to deal with the death of his father. Amen. So that, that's the value. Those, those are the values of revival. And revival ought to always be ongoing. Now, I've already presented this, 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 this legendary preacher in our city, and, and, uh, he's a, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that he is a friend of mine, and I've always looked up to him. You know, I met him, I met him uh, some 37 uh, years ago. Yeah, when I came to Second Mount Zion, he was... Uh, he was a tall giant in the forest, and, uh, and now he is the esteemed 
and beloved emeritus pastor of the Mount Carmel Baptist Church in West Philadelphia. And, uh, and uh, you know, I called him at the last moment when I got up and was getting ready and uh, I tested my voice. I said, you know what? I ain't gonna be able to do it today. And uh, I thought about Dr. Albert Franklin Campbell. And, uh, and, I call, and I called him at the last minute. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and I'm proud to say that whenever I go across the country, whenever I go to a convention or any kind of religious gathering, they, they ask, he's one of the folk that they ask about. They say, uh, Dr. Campbell, Albert Campbell is in Philadelphia. And I gladly say, yes, he's in Philadelphia. And uh, they say, you ever see him? I say, he come to my church almost, almost once, once a week, all the time. He come to my church all the time. But what I did not tell him is that the Baptist Pastors and Ministers Conference meet at my church, <laughs> and he's a part of it. Amen. So the choir is going to sing, our young people's choir is going to sing, and then the next voice that you will hear would be that of, of Dr., and I like to call his whole name, Dr. Albert Franklin Campbell, and we're delighted to have his wife with us also. Amen. <laughs> Sister Campbell. Let us give him a second Mount Zion welcome.
Amen. This is indeed the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Life is sometimes unfair, but God is good all the time. Thank God for God. I want to give respect to Pastor James Moore, Sr. Uh, he is indeed a friend, a brother in Christ, and uh, preachers have a lot of colleagues. He's one of my colleagues. Preachers have a lot of colleagues, but fewer friends. So I value friendship, and I value your pastor's friendship. Of, of the many colleagues that he knows, he could have invited any one of them to come. And you know he has a lot of colleagues, uh, but he chose to invite Albert Franklin Campbell, <laughs> pastor emeritus of the Mount Carmel Baptist Church. And I'm glad and I'm grateful that he has the spirit of outreach that he has. And he himself has made, as you probably know, an impact uh, among pastors and not just Baptist churches, but churches of color in Philadelphia. He's a fisherman. You know that, don't you? <laughs> God bless you. On this glad and glorious Sunday when my wife is here, you already, yeah. Uh, I, I, she is, she wears two hats. She is my baby doll. <laughs> but she is also uh, my administrative assistant. She gets me ready. She said, she told me, she waved her finger at me, you know what time you're supposed to be over there. And uh, I said, I know what time Pastor Moore told me to be over there, but I just can't get over there. <laughs> I'm a little slower than I used to be, uh, having, having celebrated my 90th birthday. <laughs> and uh, I was, you should know this, I was married 63 years. To my former wife, and Iris, sometime later, after her, my 63-year-long wife's demise, and she, Iris, came walking into my life. and I pursued her until I caught her. <laughs> this is an important Sunday. I haven't been to my former pastor at church uh, in about a month. And I was planning to be there today and catch up and, and meet and greet, you know, some of the folks who still think 
I'm, the pa I'm their pastor. Uh, but after we returned from our vacation to a location that we thought was m meek and mild and warm, and we ran into snow and wintry weather, uh, both of us, Iris and I, had to check with the doctor to make sure that our sneezing and coughing was not uh, COVID-related. Uh, and they checked us out and said, no, Rev, you're in pretty good shape, given your age and stage and life and all. And uh, I was glad and grateful. And so we both checked ourselves out with the doctor, and he gave us a clear and free uh, excuses for returning to church, and we were going to surprise the people at Mount Carmel and be there today. But when James Moore calls, there is no saying no to his request. You understand that, don't you? Uh, he calls mildly and respectfully but with authority, uh, as a good pastor does, as a good pastor does. So uh, I'm here, and I want to preach from the subject, a king on a donkey. A king on a donkey. And uh, while you might have read the uh, scripture on the... Uh, what do you call this? Screen. Uh, I want to read it for you, to you. It's Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. And I'm reading in the new revised standard version, so it may be a little bit different, you know, from... Uh, the versions that you have. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, saying, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee a king on a donkey. At first glance, this, this image of Jesus as Matthew's gospel portrays it is one, just one of the truly strange contradictions. A king on a donkey. Maybe it even qualifies as something called an oxymoron. 
an oxymoron. That is the bringing of total opposites together, combining them into an impossible or contradictory whole. Maybe, maybe, you see, kings who are truly kings have not been known to select donkeys as a ride of choice. Donkeys or jackasses or even asses as the King James Version of the Holy Bibles refers to such animals. That is not only basically beasts of burden, but also they are comparatively small, lowly built with uh, uh, like uh, comparatively stupid creatures, uh, ugly in appearance with long flappy ears and, and a short mane. But on the contrary, kings who are truly kings have been known to ride steeds or stallions, well-bred, high-spirited horses for war or even in parades or gala state celebrations to herald the kingly, majestic, regal status of the one who sits thereupon. But kings who are truly kings have not been known to select donkeys as rides of choice. Indeed, that would be something like preferring a Ford Pinto or a Honda Civic to a Cadillac or Lexus or Jaguar or BMW or Mercedes-Benz or Bentley, you know. And what is more, the donkey that Jesus rode on that first Palm Sunday was a borrowed donkey. It, it did not belong to the disciples whom he sent to take it and then offered it to Jesus to ride on. There's only one of two conclusions that may be drawn from this portrait painted by Matthew upon Jesus' so-called triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. Either Jesus was not then and therefore is not now a king, or he was an outstanding exception to the general popular standards of kingship, perhaps a new kind of king. Uh, uh, the fact that Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday is no disparagement to his kingship. It, it is rather a statement to the effect that he is a, 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 a king of another kind perhaps a king of peace in these days and times when it appears that the present or the former administration would rather go to war than to the table of communication and negotiation and when anger driven citizens in major metro metropolitan areas like Philadelphia would so readily resort to the use of guns, legal and illegal guns, to satisfy their anger and their hatred and misguided desires for visible and convincing vengeance. We need a king who is a king of peace. Uh, the Prince of Peace. Yeah. 
That is why Matthew was persuaded to hark back to that ancient prophet uh, and the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. Matthew's recall of that telling prophetic utterance of Zechariah, tell the daughter of Zion, look, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the colt of a donkey. Was, was not quoted by Matthew just to say that Jesus the king was a fulfillment of prophetic utterance and vision, but also it was to herald the fact that the king of which the prophet spoke was a man of peace. So that riding a donkey did no harm to who Jesus was, nor to what Jesus thought of himself. What you ride on or what you ride in does not make you what you are. Oh, hallelujah. It may affect your image of what you are or think you are in the eyes of others, but it does not make you what you really are. Whether you are in, in a pinto? You ever heard of pinto? Oh. <laughs> or on a donkey. When you know who you are and what you are, Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew what he was. He'd already settled that in his infamous, infamous duel in the desert. You know, that temptation in the wilderness when Satan the devil asked him, if you are the son of God, do this, do that, do the other. Jesus did not have to prove to the devil who he was. He knew who he was and was comfortable with who he was. The donkey was simply a symbol of the kind of king he was, a king of peace. No wonder Jesus taught, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, what? The children of God. Well, in the second place, the fact that Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday was a sign that he was a meek king. Say that, a meek king. Not a weak king, mind you, but a meek king. My brothers and sisters, there's a vast difference between meekness and weakness. Uh, the late great Dr. Ralph Sockman in his book entitled The Paradoxes of Jesus makes a great deal of the paradox of meekness in the life and identity and personhood of Jesus. Dr. Sockman therefore calls uh, his chapter on this one paradox of Jesus the meek master. The meek Master, connoting and denoting the fact that Jesus' use of the word meek, even as it applied to himself when he said, I am meek and lowly in heart, did not mean that he functioned in a servile, self-denigrating, self-defacing, self-demeaning manner as if he were the victim of an inferiority complex or, or so shy and, and insecure he slinked around in the shadows in order not to be seen. On the contrary, his meekness was his strength because it manifested an inner control of a spiritual attitude of authority and command of every situation. 
That's why when other folks got mad at him, he it didn't make him mad. They called him out of his name, but he didn't call them out of their name. Am I coming home? All righty. Not only did not did the donkey not demean him or define him because he knew who he was and he knew whose he was, but also neither did he react to or seize every opportunity presented it to him to declare his authority by displaying his power as some kings and would-be kings <clears throat> and some former presidents and oh that isn't on my paper <laughs> through deceit and egotism and narcissism declare himself to be Number one, always right, never wrong. Where was I? <laughs> Jesus didn't have to in every instance when his identity was ch ch challenged do something extraneous, you know, and, and powerful in order to prove who he was, as some kings and potentates uh, want to do for the sake of showing off and showing their mastery, make America great again. <laughs> but not Jesus. His meekness manifested itself in his compassion for people, little children, young folks, widows, Orphans, old folks, the down and out, the left back and the left out, the oppressed and mistreated, the abused and misused, and his kingship, his authority, and his power manifested itself in his ability to heal, to comfort, to lift, to deliver, to forgive, to restore to bring some good news to the people, to feed the hungry, to set the captives free. No compassionate conservative was he in the contemporary political sense, for had he been labeled compassionate conservative as uh, some of our contemporary political leadership in Washington has chosen to do, we would have to ask, where is the compassion? Yes, Want to take away Medicare and Social Security just to show? Would, would anybody in here be affected if you... Oh, uh, where is the compassion? No, Jesus was the meek master. He was a king on a donkey. But finally, I don't know how much time I have. Okay, I'm good. Say amen, Pastor Sam. <laughs> but finally, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday riding a donkey helps us to understand that while the character of his kingship really defies human expectations, nevertheless, it fulfills the divinely appointed destiny. Lord, have mercy. Sometimes even those of us who believe wonder why we have to go through some things. Have you ever stopped and pondered why is my situation so bad? Why is the Lord letting, let, we, 
we had a, a, a couple that lived in a, a unit across the hall from us, down the hall. And uh, the wife was so overcome with her husband's condition that she couldn't do very much about and was constantly serving him and taking him to the doctor. And, uh, you know, honey baby doll, can I, what can I do to relieve you? And, and she heard that uh, there was a preacher, a, a black preacher, uh, down the hall. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what I've done, Pastor Moore, I've, I pray for my family, I pray for my baby doll. <laughs> First. <laughs> and then I pray for, you know, the kids and the grandkids and, and the brothers and the sisters and, and all of that. Pray for them too. But then I have a, a longer list of folks that I pray for called extended family yeah. members. And so uh, the Jewish couple that lives down this way from us, very nice people. They take us out, show us a good time, got money. And they think Iris and I are some of the best people they've ever met. They call us to check on us, and we return the favor. And I pray for them. I would tell you what the names are, but you might know them, and that, and I'd be revealing some stuff. <laughs> Fran and Jerry. <laughs> Weinstein <laughs> and I, I and I start praying for them these are extended family and that list is longer than than the real family and sometimes baby dog goes to sleep and I'm still praying Oh, this other, this other couple, they moved out. They had to go to a place where they had more immediate care. And the wife told, uh, these are not the Weinsteins now I'm talking about. These are the other folks live down further, okay. She said, uh, said uh, Fran told them that Al, calls me Al, Al's a, a preacher retired, and he prays for us. And this lady said to, uh, to them, well, I've just given up on God. Uh, is there anybody up in here who's been through so much that you've been tempted at least? to give up on God. That's why I preface every prayer, oh dear God, the source of all light and life, wisdom and truth, the one in whom we live and move and have our being and without whom we can do nothing. I call on him, especially when the going gets tough. Just when I need him most, that's when he shows up. Are there any witnesses in the house? Have you ever been pushed with your back against the wall? And you didn't know what to do, but you, you called on him. And did he come to your rescue? Did he bring you through? Did he, 
open a door for you? Did he make a way for you? Did he heal you when you were sick? Has he ever lifted you when you were down? Has he opened any doors for you? He is a way maker. He is a door opener. He can do what no other power. Can do. I got one more. Sit down, y'all. Sit down. But, fi but finally, say finally, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, riding a donkey, helps us to understand that while the character of his kingship defies human expectations and human explanations, nevertheless, it fulfills the divinely appointed destiny. See, we, when, we, when, we, when we talk about Palm Sunday being the day of triumphal entry, you got to ask yourself, what's triumphal about it? Well, that isn't this on this paper. That's another sermon. I, I said finally, didn't I? Okay. For while the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, the Holy One of Israel, to deliver his people was a desire and an expectation that lurked and lingered long and deeply in the hearts and minds of the Hebrew people. You see, we Christians borrowed the concept of the messianic hope from Jews. That's the way they got it. Oh, well. And the principal difference is that they do not see the messianic hope fulfilled in Jesus. We do. We don't know. One of my Old Testament professors said that uh, uh, one of the differences, one of the problems with the ancient Israel's expectations was that uh, they saw their election, their selection by God as uh, giving them a special privilege. But God chose them to give them a special responsibility uh, to, to give to us the hope and expectation and see the fulfillment of the messianic hope in Jesus. He, the, he's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's, he's the Holy One of Israel. And that's another sermon. The coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, the Holy One of Israel, to deliver his people was a desire and expectation that lurked and lingered long and deeply in the hearts and minds of the Hebrew people. Yet, 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 yes. the manner of his coming right. and the character of his kingship yes. were a disappointment yes. to so many, which is why it is said, he came unto his own but his own received him not. Oh, but to those who received him, to them he gave power to become the sons and daughters of God. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the children of God. What kind of king is it whose expectant mother was denied access to a decent place in which he might have been born? 
but rather had to be born in a stable for animals, wrapped in available cloth and laid in a rustic feeding, animal feeding trough for the animals as a crib. Foxes, Jesus said, have holes. And birds of the, of the air have nests. But, but the Son of Man has no, nowhere ah, to lay his head. And while he had no regular pulpit of his own, nor access thereto, but rather like a vagabond preacher or an itinerant rabbi preached and taught from makeshift podiums, boats and houses and foothills and anywhere in the out of doors. And yet and yet and yet somebody said, never a man spoke like this man. For he spoke as one having authority, power, and not as the scribes and Pharisees. Indeed, what kind of king would tell his close friend and disciple and defender when his conspirators and enemies came to take him away? Put up your sword, for he who kills by the sword shall perish by the sword and allow himself to be arrested and tried and convicted on false charges. In fact, precisely because he did not rally the troops and garner an army to meet and match and master the Roman battalions who had occupied their holy land. The people, the crowds, preferred to have Barabbas, oh hallelujah, released set free instead of Jesus of Nazareth. At least Barabbas was a troublemaker, a kind of revolutionary who was ready to fight and die if necessary for what he believed. At least his kind of rabble-rousing patriotism revved up his emotions of the crowds sufficiently to get them to cry out in rhythmic chant, release to us Barabbas, release to us Barabbas. Then what shall I do with Jesus? Who is called Christ, asked Pilate of the people. And with equal enthusiasm, as they had expressed before, they cried out, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. And they took him and whipped him, placed a purple robe on his shoulders and placed a plaited crown of thorns on his brow to mock his majesty. And then they forced him to bear his own cross, the instrument of his own crucifixion, and nailed him to it. They thrust a spear in his side and he hung on the cross and they mocked him until he died. What kind of king is this, you may ask? He is the kind of king that reigns even from the tree on which they hung him. For not only was one of the two criminals hanging on either side of him heard to say Jesus Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom to which Jesus replied not tomorrow not next week not next month but today, yeah. 
I used to be able to turn around real quick. I can't do that in Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Oh, hallelujah. That, and, and, and he proved that he was all he claimed to be and all they claimed him to be when he got up. Where was he? He got up after they had taken him down from the cross and laid him in a borrowed tomb. It wasn't a permanent place of residence. It was a borrowed. Laid him in a borrowed tomb. Uh, uh, what kind of king is this, you may ask? He is the kind of king that reigns even from the tree on which they hung him. Hallelujah. And he proved that he was all he claimed to be and all they claimed him to be. When three days later, he got up, didn't he? From the dead on Easter Sunday morning, and he will prove himself to be all they claimed him to be, and all he claimed to be, and more besides, when he comes back, he is coming back. He is coming back. He's coming back to get all of those who believe and trust in him. I don't know what post-pandemic may mean. This, this situation of, of, of storms and tornadoes and, and, and all of that, what do they call that? What? What do they call yeah, global warming. It may be worse than coronavirus because every time you turn the TV on, if they're not shooting somebody, tornadoes are coming. There. And we came close to one last night, didn't we? I can't tell you. I didn't come up here to tell you when he's coming back. I just know he's coming. <laughs> And the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign. He shall reign. How long is he going to reign? Forever, forever, forever. So I came up here this morning to ask you to join me in saying, right on. Right on. Right on. King Jesus, no man can hinder you. He's got a time schedule of his own. Oh, hallelujah. I'm done. Right on. Right on. Right on. Right on. Oh. There may be somebody here, Brother Pastor, who is outside the fellowship of the church and who has not accepted Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you may want to come, man, woman, boy, or girl, pastor is standing here giving you opening the doors of the church extending an invitation to you who are here or to you who may be watching on whatever you're watching it on I'm glad that when I was 13 13 years old the son of a preacher the grandson of a preacher I was 13, and when they opened the doors of the church, I just got up and I said, this is what the Lord wants me to do. 
So I just walked down the aisle, and the saints accepted me because they prayed for me on the altar, but they accepted me. There may be somebody here today on this Palm Sunday. Don't you want to make him king of your life? King of your life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget Gethsemane. Lead me to Calvary. Is there anyone here? Is there anyone here? Anyone here who needs to come and wants to come to make Jesus the Christ your king? your king. He's ready, ready to receive you, and these are ready to receive you into the fellowship of the church. Won't you come? Won't you come? Amen. Amen. And amen. What a mighty word. What an on time word. What a helpful word. A king on a donkey. What a what a paradoxical statement. Amen. You normally you would sing a king on a stallion but not a donkey, because this king knows who he is. Amen. Because whether you're riding in a Pinto or a Cadillac, it don't make you who you are. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for, for that mighty word. Thank you for that seasoned word. Amen. 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 I, don't know about you, but I certainly I've been, I've been blessed of the Lord, and I've been blessed with that word. It's tithing and giving time. What kind of giver does the Lord love? God loves a cheerful giver, and the way we give here at Second Mount Zion, uh, there is, for the members, there's a tithing box in the back. And if you're visiting with us today and need an envelope, just raise your hand. The ushers is coming through, and you can drop it in the basket, or you can use the scan, the QR reader on the screen, or you can pay on easy tides, or you can just drop it in the basket as they come forward. Yeah. Yeah, the QR, the QR code is right, is right behind you, Sandra. Oh, amen. Y'all make, make sure you get it. Ducky, I see you. I 
I see you got your anniversary money. Amen. But, but Ducky got his got his hundred and twenty-five dollars. Need it. Do y'all need any baskets in the balcony? Did everybody give in the balcony? Kelly, everybody with you? They gave. Beverly Owens, everybody on your side, did they give? Amen. Anybody did not have an opportunity to give? If you did not have an opportunity to give and they passed you by, just raise your hand. Oh, you're going to put, put yours in the uh, tithing box. Amen. Let us stand. All things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given thee. Amen and amen. Thank you, uh, Sister Iris Campbell, for sharing and uh, getting him here. And uh, Pastor Campbell now is going to come back with his closing remarks and give us our benediction. Closing remarks? Yes. And benediction. And benediction, okay. Thank you, Pastor. You're very kind. And I appreciate all of you. Uh, you made me think you were listening and responding. God bless you. Uh, keep us in your thoughts. Make us members of your extended family. <laughs> Albert and Iris, you can, Lord knows, uh, you don't have to say, bless, bless Reverend Camel. You say, Albert. <laughs> And Iris, thank you, Jim, uh, for letting me stand here uh, with heads bowed and hearts lifted unto God. Lord, we thank you that we are here worshiping together uh, where uh, masks are optional, I guess, and we are still conscious that we are not fully and completely in a post uh, COVID pandemic time. Uh, it could reappear and it could come back. And so we want to do what we can do, not to be communicants of, of that. Uh, and we want above all to please you. So we ask you, dear God, to watch over us as we prepare to leave this place. Go with us, stand by us, open doors for us, make ways for us. For those who are sick, heal us, dear God, because you can. You can do what no other power can do. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling 
and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. And all the people of God said,